Assalamualaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Wa alaikum salam wa Islam also to the Sheikh. Um, well, um, after the Battle of Bandar, um, there were some Jews who were traitors, um, known as the Bani Khureza, and the Prophet وسلم, is reported to have slaughtered them um, by Ibn Ishaq and other Muslim commentators. I was just wondering, they were traitors, but did they really deserve to be slaughtered, and were they slaughtered? Um, if the Sheikh could answer that. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. This is uh, this is something yeah that is used uh, as an example by um, many people around the world as you know well look at what your your prophet has done sure so. there were three renowned Jewish tribes in um, in Medina uh, the Banu Nadir the Banu Qainuqa and the Banu Qurayza the Banu Qurayza is the one who the brother is referencing uh, they had agreed as we mentioned earlier in the constitution of Medina amongst the lines which were stipulated which we didn't get to was that you'll protect the state from forces outside, external. So if the Quraysh were to attack from Mecca, your role would be to protect the state, and your role would certainly not be to go behind the back of the state in an act of treason. Yeah. But now, for example, in a political system, you have, um, you have a case where this country has made um, an agreement with another country, and before they know it, they've gone behind the back and made an agreement of enemies, you think this country is just going to sit down and say, well, you know, we forgive you, well done, and you can move on with your life. If you know that the people you've taken in a peace agreement four years earlier, whatever it was, that you've agreed that you're not going to cooperate with enemy forces, and then they go behind your back. Uh, the Qurayza went behind the back of the Prophet and they aligned with Abu Sufyan's army in the Ahzab, in the Battle of Khandaq, in the, in the, you know, in the period of the 60 after Hijra. Um, and of course, their plans were revealed to the Holy Prophet. They had broken their agreement. The agreement was not so no such thing would happen. Now, the brother mentions Ibn Ishaq, and you've got, you know, you've got different sort of opinion. Ibn Ishaq's opinion, you've got Waqadi's opinion, you've got um, Tabari's opinion on the issue, and there are many different versions of how this is narrated. But one version that stands out is where the Prophet tells them that, do you mind if I'm the arbitrator in this issue? Yeah. And they reply, no, we want Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh as the arbitrator. Thinking that a prophet whose policies may not have a prophet whose verses, which he's revealed in the Quran, or has uh, conveyed to the people, which aren't necessarily praising of the children of Israel, they're thinking that he's definitely going to be one who's going to attack us now. Yeah. They say, we're going to go Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh. And that was a decision that went against them. The narrations, and this needs a longer discussion, I've discussed this, I have a lecture on this topic. The narrations uh, talk of, um, of Sa'ad al Ma'ad removing the kids, removing the woman, that they are not to be killed. And that anybody who wants to come towards the religion of Islam is more than welcome to come. Um, who doesn't feel that this treachery, they were part of it, they are able to come forward. And that there are different numbers which are given as to how many were killed. You find that some try later on, those who are against the religion of Islam, to exaggerate the situation. Whereas the reality is the few who were killed were seen as being the leaders of okay. the Quraysh, and the ones who clearly had made an agreement with the Quraysh at Khandaq that they would side and help them attack the Holy Prophet. It's an act of treason. Yes. And at the end of the day, either you have a state with laws, or you just don't have any law whatsoever. Um, an act of treason where you're telling them that, look, that prophet is working here, his companion's there, he's protecting him here, that one's going to do this here. You might as well go join their Plot, army. Plotting to, plotting, kill, yes. plotting to kill them. Basically. Plotting with deception as well. Yeah. One minute they're smiling with you, mm. and the next minute they're against you. Yeah, thank you. Um, yes, that's, uh, we could, inshallah, hopefully have another program on that one as well. We've got another call waiting on the line, which we're going to take now. Asalaamu Alaikum. Asalaamu Alaikum. Wa Alaikum Asalaam. Uh, my name is Hamza, calling from London. Um, I just had a question about um, the Prophet and his wife. Um, some questions have been raised by uh, non-believers and things about some of his wives, um, such as uh, Aisha, for example, who was married at a very young age, or um, Sophia, who was uh, taken as a wife of the Prophet um, following a battle um, under some uh, <laughs> circumstances of, you know, taking people as, um, as basically property after um, a war. And 
how does this fit in with um, the morals of today, um, marrying somebody so young, first of all, or, um, or taking people as basically property? Um, okay. okay, thank you. Thank you very much. When we discuss the, the marriages of the Holy Prophet, you have a division. If we were to say his life is 63 years, yeah. you've got 0 to 25, you've got 25 till 51, and 51 till 63. 0 to 25, he's not married to anyone. 25 till 51, he's married to one lady and one lady alone. And that is the love of his life. No wife comes near her. And that is Khadija. 26 years, they're married. Then after that, there's a series of marriages from the age of 51 to 63. And these marriages are for different reasons. So for example, he married Zainab, his cousin, to introduce a law that the ex-wife of your adopted son, you can marry her. Yeah. There is no stigma against her. Then there was another group of widows, old ladies, you know, um, who had been married, they're widowed, their husbands had died at war, and he'd marry them. Examples, Um Salama and Hafsa. Then you have the example of, um, as the brother mentioned, you got Safiya, or he mentions the general issue of taking a prisoner from war. That prisoner from war, when she saw the behavior of this man, notice that the Holy Prophet Sorry. from the beginning of the Battle of Badr had said, I don't want to see people whose hands are tied. I want you to feed them what you eat. I want you to clothe them with what you wear. I want them to drink what you drink. I want them to be treated as humane as possible. When the person sees this, she thinks to herself, you know what, As in, this man, I heard so much bad things about him. I can't believe his behavior. His behavior is impeccable. My father, heading, you know, let's say heading Ben Mustalak, for example, um, told me this man is, you know, is savage. This man is, a, you know, he, he'll kill anything that gets in the way. But I've just seen pure morals from the man. Yeah. And I don't want to return back to these people. I want the, him as a husband. As in, if a man can behave like this, and he heads this whole state, but he's as humble as anyone, then I want to marry him. Then you have the case of Aisha. In Aisha's case, I proved in the past, I have a lecture from 2006, where I've proved that Aisha wasn't nine when she married the Holy Prophet, but was older. And the differences of opinion between the age of 14 and 18, you can see the different hadiths which prove that she definitely wasn't nine. And that the same narrator who mentions her being nine seems to be a narrator who was anti-Islam okay. in, um, in his opinions. Who who, you, who uh, uh, Ali bin Ahmed al-Kufi is, and you've got Ahmed al-Sayyari as well, being amongst the narrators. The lecture is available on the internet okay. about the mothers of the believers where I discuss the whole issue. Um, of the age. Thank you. And actually, um, reflecting on uh, the age, I mean, some people do say she was 13, which is the same age as Juliet in Romeo and Juliet. Mm. So, uh, and that's performed, you know, all over Europe and nobody, nobody objects about the age of Juliet. Very true. So, okay. Um, um, I recently came to the Palaf and the Beit Ali and your, your lectures have helped me a lot. I just want to say thank you very much and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, reward you for your thank own you. Thank you. lectures. Thank, thank you very much, sister. I appreciate uh, it. Can I ask a question, please? Yes, go ahead. Um, there is a uh, verse in the Quran, and Allah SWT says, um, All you believe, do not raise your voice above the voice of the Prophet. And it was, and there were people who raised the voice um, to the Prophet, and those people, uh, according to us, don't agree with them, and we regard them um, to be among the hypocrites. But Allah, he said, all who you believe. I'm just a bit confused about it. Okay, uh, all right, I see. I get it, yeah. Okay, thank you, sister. That's a regular caller as well. Yeah. Okay, yes. Um, uh, the verse is Surah 49, verse number 2 of the Quran. In Surah Al-Hujurat, um, uh, all you who believe do not raise your voices above the voice of the prophets. And then later on, it continues to talk about there being a nullifying of your deeds when such an act is performed. Now, certain people will straight away take this in the context of another incident where someone clearly raised his voice above the voice of the Prophet, whereas this incident wasn't revealed about the pen and paper incident. Yeah. Um, this incident, there was a clear raising of the voice. Um, on one occasion, one narration states somebody raised his voice against somebody else in the presence of the Prophet. Another narr uh, narration is about somebody who was less abled and, um, and he raised his voice loudly when he'd speak to the Prophet. Mm. 
But if we were to take the principle that Quran says, don't raise your voices above the voice of the Prophet, which ironically is on the top of the Prophet's grave at the moment in Medina. That verse is written there. Um, irony. Yeah. Uh, because you've got certain people who were known um, at Hudaybiyah and at the pen and paper incident, both times there was a raising of the voice. Yeah. So the Prophet had to say, you know, leave this company. Now, if you, if you go and tell someone that this person raised his voice against the Prophet, they'll turn around to you and, and try and somehow shift the whole religion so that the religion fits this person. Not that this person has blatantly been rude to the Prophet, no. How can I shift the religion to suit his personality? And, uh, you know, the books of hadith are clear about the ones who raise their voice. Even if someone says, but that hadith doesn't say exactly who it is. Yeah. The fact that you've cultured these companions for 21 years of your life, yet there's an incident where you tell them, get out of my house, goes to show you there are some who had the audacity to raise their voice. Yeah, yeah. And their deeds would be nullified according to the verse. So I think also the sister was asking, would they technically be called believers if it says, oh, oh you who believe? Well, naturally, the verse would be addressing the Medanites, and the Medanites yeah. have all said, la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah. it's, it's encompassing, but then it's, it's also specific as well. Definitely. Okay, all right. So, um, so, yeah, I mean, there was also uh, the, the issue of how he established the polity of, of Medina. This is the fashionable word now to mm, use, polity, mm, rather yes. than state. Yes. Um, perhaps we don't need to go into that as to why. But um, what was this constitution of Medina? Why was he, why he again, I mean, we can see sort of his, how he was considered so trustworthy that he, as technically an outsider, has been invited to act as a leader over this um, polity. So what, what, was the, what were the contents of this constitution? And why was it drawn up? Well, you've got um, the, the environment in Medina. You've got Jews who are living there. You've got Christians who are living there. You may have a certain segment who aren't necessarily believers in God who are living there. Now, you want a peaceful environment. If you're going to establish an Islamic state, not only do you want to make sure that your citizens know what their rights are, you, you want to make sure that everybody of other religions knows that they can practice their religion, not out of fear. So, amongst the, you know, amongst the messages that were stipulated within this constitution, the Jews will practice their religion. The Christians will practice their religion and the Muslims will practice their religion. If a Muslim attacks a Jew, he's to be punished. If a Christian attacks a Jew, is to be punished. If a Jew attacks a Christian, if a Jew attacks, and so on. So it wanted to build an environment where they recognize that you are all people of the book. You have more in common than you have differences. You have your respected places of worship. Notice in chapter 22, verse 39 to 40, when the Prophet was ordered by God to defend himself in the Battle of Badr, the verse states, if it wasn't for these people defending themselves, there wouldn't be a single synagogue, church, or mosque oh, yeah. in this area. So it's as if it's saying there wouldn't be a single place where God's name is called out. And this constitution was trying to remind everyone that, look, we all believe in God. We may have differences in certain theological issues, but it shouldn't be leading to us being intolerant of each other. Yeah, yeah. A person should have tolerance. If someone has different opinion to me, it doesn't mean I, I don't speak to them, I don't interact with them. No, there's issues which we can agree to agree, or we agree to disagree. Okay, thank you. And uh, we've got another call now waiting on the line, which we can take right now. Asalaamu As Alaikum. Alaikum Salaam. Wa Alaikum Salaam. Um, I'd like to ask a question, please. Please go ahead. Um, why were the first ayahs of Surah Abbasah revealed? Why were they revealed? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Surah Abbas, Surah 80 of the Quran, uh, Abbas wa tawalla and ja'ahu al-a'ma is a point of disagreement between certain people um, where some say that uh, there was this man by the name of uh, Abdullah bin Umm Maktoum who entered upon a gathering of the Prophet when he was sitting with certain of the Arab aristocrats. And that when he raised the voice saying, give me a piece of advice, someone frowned at him. Mm -hmm. Now there are some schools which say it was the Prophet who frowned. And there are others who say, well, it's contradictory that the Prophet would frown. Number one, the basis that the Quran says, وَإِنَّكَ لَا عَلَىٰ خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ That you are a man of sublime morals. Yeah. Number two, that the Quran says um, that do not push away those who pray to their Lord in the morning and the evening. 
Uh, and here you've got a believer who prays to his Lord the Quran saying, you know, it's not the action of a prophet that he would even do such a thing. Keep these people close to you. Um, and the Quran also talks of a prophet when it states, that the Quran says if the prophet was a hard hearted man, people would have run away from him. But because he was soft hearted, people would visit him. You have even in the, if you were just to read the first two verses alone, um, he frowned uh, and turned away when he saw the blind man or when the blind man entered upon yeah. him. If you stop there, then you could say it's the prophet. If you move on, it talks about this idea that as for the one who is, um, who, according to you know some translations, the one who's wealthy, you show him um, a lot of attention. As for the one who comes to you sincerely and he fears Allah, you don't show any attention to him. Is this befitting of a prophet of God? Yeah. As in this prophet of God, is he the type of person that the ones who are rich, he shows them a lot of time. And the ones who are poor, he doesn't show them any attention. On the contrary. Look at the behavior of this man. There was no differentiation between the rich and the poor. Um, he would be a man who would welcome everybody. You may have a, a rich person like Mus'ab fe feeling welcomed by him, or a poor person like Ammar feeling welcomed by him. A rich person like Uthman ibn Affan, feeling welcomed by him and a poor person for example like Salman in the background that he had come from in those turbulent years who was welcomed by him so if you leave Abbas and keep going on with the verses it's the behavior of somebody else yeah, yeah. Uh, that type of behavior um, and you know we have our opinion within the school of Ahlul Bayt that uh, a member from the Umayyads was the one who frowned at that blind man. Now if you were to mention this person's name, this member from the Umayyad clan, you'll find someone saying, how dare you say that the prophet, uh, that uh, this man would frown as a blind man? How dare you insult him? So the man who came to establish akhlaq frowns at the blind man, but this person doesn't? As in sometimes the Muslims have to reassess their balances, yeah. their scales. Some of them have got some quite atrocious scales um, in the way that they actually look at such concepts. You know, that the Prophet of Allah who came in I've come to establish the uh, and perfect the morals of the people. Um, which taskiyah is this that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa comes to purify mankind now a prophet of God who frowns at blind man me and you can go the whole of our life without fr frowning at a blind man true we can yeah. as in you'll find there are a lot of people who uh, their heart will become soft when they see someone who's disabled or someone who's blind Yet the prophet who came to establish morals, no, he finds it normal to frown at blind people. Yeah. I don't know. It's in our school, um, on the whole, according to the scholars and the early theologians, you'll find that they'll state that it doesn't refer to yeah. the prophet. It's not logical. Yeah. Thank you very much. We've got another.